Welcome to Nebraska Innovation Campus on the, this November 6th edition of the Hearman Lecture Series. We're very pleased today uh, to have a very distinguished panel joining us uh, here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln to discuss the issue of agricultural communication in the 21st century. What does that mean? What are some of the challenges around communications in the greater agricultural sector and space? My name is Ronnie Green. I have the privilege of serving as the Vice Chancellor of the Institute of Agriculture and Natural Resources here at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln and as Vice President of the University of Nebraska System. Our format today will be to engage in a framing of the issue, if you will, from four panelists. Uh, we will be moderated by Orion Samuelson, uh, who I'll introduce to you here in just a moment. Following the framing comments of each of our four panelists, we'll have a, a period of dialogue amongst the panel uh, that Orion will lead us through. And then we'll have an opportunity for the audience to participate in about the last 25 minutes of the time that we have with you uh, to raise questions to the panel and to further dialogue from the floor. So as you have questions or thoughts, that you would like to provide in that last part of our discussion, roughly the last half hour. Uh, please jot those down. Uh, we will have floor mics on the floor on each side of the conference facility here that where we will bring those mics to you to be able to address the questions to the panel. The Hearman Lectures are a series that we started here at the university now in its fourth year. Uh, we've had three very successful years of dialogues around the issues of global food security, natural resource security, rural landscape security, community security, enabled by a very generous gift from Keith and Norma Hearman, uh, who the lectures are named after. Very rarely is it the case that Keith misses one of these lectures, but unfortunately he was unable to be here today due to a family conflict, but nonetheless, I would like for you to join me in thanking the Hearman family for helping us to bring these world leaders to our campus uh, through a lecture series like uh, the Hearman Lectures. Thank you very much, Keith and Norman. I'd not now like to introduce the moderator for our panel this afternoon. Uh, many of you will recognize his voice when he first starts to talk to us this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Orion Samuelson. Orion is a fixture, I'll call it, a legend in the agricultural broadcasting world uh, with WGN in Chicago where he's the voice of agriculture there, uh, is involved in RFD TV, uh, has 18 different broadcasts that he's involved in on a routine and regular basis. I could read off a whole list of honors that Orion has received over the course of his career not the least of which is an honorary doctorate from his alma mater, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I actually have to tell the story of how we got Orion here. He very graciously offered himself on a silent auction at the Farm Foundation, a group that I happen to have the chance to be part of. It's a round table of leaders from across agriculture that meet a couple of times a year. And one of their fundraisers was a silent auction. And I happened to notice on this silent auction, one of the offerings was an opportunity to dialogue with Orion Samuelson, the voice of agriculture. So I bid on it and successfully won the silent auction. And so we were able to get Orion here uh, through the auspices, if you will, in that way of the Farm Foundation. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Orion Samuelson from WGN. God, I didn't know I'd been sold. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, Ronnie. I appreciate that, and thank you for the welcome to Nebraska. 
state I've had the opportunity to visit many times and have certainly known your secretaries of agriculture and saw their statues today. And uh, I knew Cliff Harden and uh, worked with him. I knew Clayton Eider, worked with him, and most recently worked with uh, Mike Johans. And as far as Morton is concerned, I use his salt every day. So, uh, <laughs> and, uh, interestingly enough, we do have an arboretum in a western suburb of Chicago. It's about uh, 200 acres called the Morton Arboretum. Well, I'm joined uh, today by an interesting group of people that I'm going to begin by just having them sign in. So during the discussion, you'll know who they are. I'll get back to them for their initial presentation. But uh, just a quick sign in, starting with you, Barb Glenn. Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Barb Glenn, and it is indeed a personal and professional pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for inviting me. I'm a Husker by birth. Um, I'm actually an animal scientist. I did research for 17 years, but I switched gears, changed careers to go into uh, policy issues, regulatory, and how science impacts those in the DC arena. So I've been doing that for a long time. I've been faced with some very contentious communication opportunities and enjoyed every minute of it. So as an Aggie, I encourage all of you to be engaged in these kinds of conversations. At this time, I am the CEO of the National Association of State Departments of Agriculture, and I'm honored and pleased to represent the commissioners, secretaries, and directors of all 50 states and four territories. And I am also honored to point out that uh, Director Ibaugh, who is here somewhere, is our current vice president of the NASDA board, and he is an exceptional leader, and it's just a pleasure working with him. So the way I look at um, this question that we have today. Well, no, do you I'm going to come back to you. I'm okay. going to come back okay. to you because right. it's time for Kevin Murphy to okay. sign in. Do that. All right. Sorry about that. That's Kevin. okay. <laughs> Name is Kevin Murphy. I own a uh, company called Food Chain Communications. We work with people um, basically what I would say from conception to consumption. And the idea uh, came to me after spending 14 years in the publishing business where we had really sexy titles like pork and drovers and dairy herd and swine practitioner uh, and products like that and um, I, started the own, I started my own business because I saw a need in agriculture to communicate differently than it ever has and that need is, is just continuing to rise and that's what I look forward to getting into today on the topic. And Marcy Tressman. Hi, Marcy Tessman, president of Charleston, Norweg. We're a communications and strategic consultant firm based in Heartland, Wisconsin and Austin, Texas. And we work with a number of clients in the food system. I grew up in agriculture. I'm a farm kid, married a farmer, and uh, had an ethanol plant on the farm. And so I have the livestock and uh, cropping background, but we help our clients to really connect those dots throughout the food system. And then the kid on the end over here, Ronnie Green, where did you go to school, Ronnie? Uh, my, my background is in Virginia. I get kidded a lot in Nebraska about the little bit of twang in my voice. Uh, but I grew up in Virginia, a graduate of Virginia Tech and Colorado State and the University of Nebraska. And my, my career has allowed me the opportunity to be involved across the sectors. So I spent time in academia as a professor in animal genetics, uh, working with the cattle industry, then was in private industry in a startup company earlier in my career, then in government research administration with the U.S. Department of Agriculture. And before coming back to the university here in my current role, I was um, in the animal health sector working on the development of a new part of Pfizer Animal Health, what is now Zoetis, uh, as an animal health company. Okay, and uh, you've met my kids, so now I'll tell you a little bit because I am the elder, I'm far and away up here. I uh, grew up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin without electricity, and uh, we used blackboards in the school and I used a seed corn notebook and a stubby pencil with an eraser to communicate and take notes. But I want to share with you just one story to give you an idea of what has happened 
in this communications business in my lifetime. Take you back to a day in April of 1945. The war was still winding down. B batteries for our radio were rationed and they had died, so we had no newspaper, we had no radio. We really didn't have any communication with the outside world. Foggy day, snow melting, foggy day. I'm standing on a knoll above the house and our neighbor Carmen Simonson across a valley, probably a half mile away. I can see him through the fog and he starts pounding on the bottom of an old wash tub. And when he saw he had my attention, he cupped his hands to his mouth and said, Orion, tell your parents the president died today. April 12th, 1945, the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt before the war ended. That's how I learned that news. That was our communication. Fast forward 16 years, I'm standing on a stage at a hotel in Atlanta, Georgia, emceeing a program for the American Soybean Association. Alongside me is a huge screen. The subject is who is buying and who is growing soybeans. And during that hour presentation on the screen, we saw a soybean buyer in Tokyo who talked to us. We saw a soybean grower in Brazil who talked to us. We saw a soybean buyer in London who talked to us instantly in color just 16 years after that foggy day. And now fast forward to today at WGN Radio, I could do a broadcast from here or a Nebraska cornfield that would sound like I was in the studio with a gadget I hold in my hand. And who knows where it's going? That's what we're going to talk about today and its impact on agriculture. We've seen the changes and they're probably minimal compared to the changes we're going to see. So Barb Glenn, I'm going to start with you to offer your thoughts on communicating to agriculture and for agriculture in the 21st century. Well, thank you. Uh, and when we take to the question today about um, what does ag communication mean in the 21st century, to me, I think a, a big audacious goal for all of us that we would all love is that everyone um, understands uh, where their food come from, comes from. They understand agriculture, they understand the uh, historical and cultural significance in our past that we've had. And I think that um, that's good for society, it's good for um, you know, public health, it's good for stewardship to the environment, and it's just good for um, Americans to understand that cultural history. So I'm looking for that big audacious goal that, that all, all folks understand where their food comes from. Um, I think we need a 21st century ag communications toolbox that's completely different. Um, right now we've got all kinds of tools that are exciting and new and unique. Folks at my age bracket don't know how to use them all. But I would challenge us today that we're missing a key um, participant in this panel, and that is the, the youth, the young people. One of our greatest assets, I think, going forward in this toolbox is the young voices who are, understand food and agriculture. So I'd just like to lay that out as a, as a first thought that we, um, we need to bring in the millennials. And I would love to have had one of you all down here on the panel to really tell us what to do. So I think I'll stop there and punt the ball over to Okay, you. Kevin, your turn. All right, um, as I looked at the topic today of communicating agriculture in the 21st century, I thought we, we can't probably even get close to an answer until we recognize a few things. And that is the, the seismic shift that has occurred in, in communications, which Orion just talked about. Um, I can't tell you the impact of the internet in agriculture. I, th I still believe agriculture as a whole in communicating itself is struggling with how to use that and what to do, um, which seems probably nonsensical to youth today. The other thing I would say is there's a seismic shift in culture. And in, with that cultural shift, people are looking at the food system and agriculture in particular, and they're asking questions that have never been asked before. And they're asking for agriculture to respond, um, what I would call through the lens of morality and ethics. And the reason I say that 
is because more and more companies are starting to distinguish themselves based on those grounds, that they are more ethical or more moral than the next company. And this has led to a lot of confusion from agriculture. And really, uh, when you take a look at how agriculture has responded, we've really been ill-equipped, ill-prepared for such a thing. Uh, so much so that even today, if we go back to when Orion talked about agriculture, I would bet that if you went to a university then, agriculture was unquestionably the answer to any problem. Whereas today, when you go to many university campuses or to discussions about agriculture, it is presented as a problem, as quite possibly the culprit for social ills. And so that desire to communicate through morality is being heard loud and clear. Marcy. We have a mantra at our office. It's actually on our wall. It's not what you say, it's what they hear. Now that's not a new statement at all, but we think it rings very true for the audiences that we're communicating <clears throat> with today. We run a consumer polling survey every year, and this year we picked not a new topic, it's GMOs. And what we found was really interesting. So many consumers today still don't know what a GMO is, yet they find that they're very concerned. They've developed a very big fear for a lot of the technologies that we have in agriculture. So how do we deal with that? As we work with our clients on communicating to consumers, consumers that first, they're further and further removed from the farm, so they have little knowledge of it, yet they wanna know so much more than they used to about the food that they're eating. We tell our clients, we need to listen. We need to sit at the table with those with opposing viewpoints and understand where they're coming from, what their needs are, and what are their motivations. We need to be accessible to them. We need to be transparent. And that's engaging in a conversation in a very different way than we used to. Ronnie, do you want to do uh, some comments here or do you want to save a wrap up once we finish? No, I'll, I'll make a few okay. comments and tag on to a few things that have already been said. I, I've been involved in this business a long time, so I'm beginning to be able to show how long by how much hair I have and what color it is. But uh, over 50 years that I've lived my life in agriculture. And especially over the last 30 years in my professional career time, there has been a seismic shift. I agree uh, with Kevin. There's been a seismic shift around the discussion what the discussion is about. I can recall when I was growing up in the age of some of our college students that are in the audience, technology was sexy. It was exciting. The abundance that technology gave and was, rep was allowing revolutionizing to happen in agriculture was welcomed, was excited, was, it was an exciting time for agriculture in the 70s and the 80s and the abundance that came from that. Fast forward to today, and we, we live in quite a different culture, where Marcy mentioned the word fear. There seems to be an escalation that fear sells, fear of the unknown, or fear, or, you know, fear of what I don't understand, or I might not know, or I might not be able to connect the dots. And as a scientist, I'm really concerned about fear of science and fear of the technologies that come from science. Some of you will remember the first lecture of the year that we had in this room on climate change and climate variability and impacts on Nebraska of climate change. And I was sharing with the panelists before we started uh, this afternoon. I recall a point in that dialogue when we were taking questions from the floor where there was a question raised about GMOs and were inferring that GMOs were a bad thing. When we had just gotten done talking about science related to climate variability 
and climate change, and I think my response was, I'm a little confused as to why we're fearful of this science, but we're not fearful of this science. There was a real conundrum there to me in that, in that story, if you will. So this escalation of fear, you know, uh, feeding off of fear and fear cells, put together with a platform like we have in social media, and a platform that we have of instant accessibility to uh, information or messages, and an entertainment culture, frankly, I'm going to be a little provocative here, an entertainment culture when anyone can become an authority on a subject and begin to develop a movement around that authority or that subject. I won't mention any names, but you might be able to think of a few people that might fit that description that are involved in the food discussion today, that are changing some of the cultural thinking about food that is non-science based, entirely non-science based. So that, I see that as a challenge for those of us who are either directly engaged in agriculture, that 2% in the production and food production and retailing sector, as well as for those of us who are supporting those efforts with research and education, and I'll stop there. Okay, I would just add a couple of comments as a broadcaster. Um, the most important part of communicating is listening. I learned that a long time ago, even though I make my living by talking, the most important part, because until you hear what people are trying to tell you, you really cannot effectively communicate. And I have uh, a rule that if I get a letter or an email from an angry listener, I'll read it today and I'll get angry. I'll read it tomorrow, get a little less angry. Maybe by the third or fourth day, I kind of understand why they're feeling that way. And then I'll respond because there's a rule in my office, think before you hit the send button because you can do some things that are very bad. So you've got to, uh, to do that. Another rule I have is it's much more important to be right than first. In our 24-hour news channel society today, where you constantly have to have something to fill 24 hours, and time and again you see people that have to be first and then later on have to come back and do the last thing that I want to do is, gee, I made a mistake, I'm sorry. It's much more important to be right and correct. The challenges that I have as a broadcaster, people hear what they want to hear. I have any number of people over the years come up and said, Samuelson, you said this. I go back and listen to the tape and I didn't say that. But listeners tend to hear what they want to hear, whether it's over broadcast or whether it's one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And the term that I hate most of all in the news business, breaking news. God, isn't every news breaking? Why do we have to do that one all the time? And then keep in mind the definition of news that a reporter gave me years ago in Green Bay, Wisconsin. He was an old Associated Press reporter and he said, just remember, the definition of news is, it's the opposite of what's happening. And you think about that, 5,000 airplanes land safely every day, you don't hear about it, one misses and it's front page, so. Now, in light of what I just said, let me explain something that will also uh, give you an idea of my mental capability. I was 18 before I dared to talk back to my dad, and maybe disagree, but at age 18 I said, Dad, I am not going to spend the rest of my life getting up at 5 o'clock in the morning to milk cows, which I was doing at the time. And he gave me the look that said the grass isn't always greener, but you have to find it. So ever since, I became a farm broadcaster, and now I get up at a quarter to three in the morning <laughs> to do a program who get up at, for people who get up at five o'clock to milk cows. Does not say much about what's going on up here. Okay. 
One thing I have to find out, since I was on the board of directors for 32 years of the Illinois Leadership Foundation, where's the lead group? Where are you? I thought you were here. Oh, way up there in the cheap seats. And over there, okay. In the cheap seats, okay. Uh, question for you to discuss. Why do people prefer to believe emotion rather than science? Where have we gone wrong with science? Who wants it, Barb? Well, I'll start. I, I am an animal scientist. I cut my teeth on science, just like Ronnie. And um, I value that that should be a, a, a rule we all adopt, that we will follow a science-based uh, rubric when we have our discussions. But I think what we need to value beyond that is to recognize that uh, scientific literacy is, is reasonably low, and agricultural literacy in this country is even lower. And I know at our NASDA annual meeting, we focused on a panel on cultivating uh, agricultural literacy and the high need to do that. So I think that science has, um, it's not the whole picture, but I think that we need to be able to reach out and have open conversation and listen and have the compassion to uh, understand those that do not agree with us, perhaps because they're misinformed. So we can bring that science in in that conversation. And I think it's everyone here's role and responsibility to participate in those kinds of hard conversations. Yeah. I mean, we do that in D the DC arena every day and it's um we know that the big tent is an important aspect to moving policy moving regulation there's give and take and you have to be able to talk to your your diversity or those that don't agree with you kevin you know harris interactive did a poll that said 80 percent of americans don't understand science 80 percent 80 percent and i would argue 10 percent more lied <laughs> because most people do not understand science. And this has been, as I said, one of the dramatic shifts for agriculture because we like to talk science. We like to tell people about science. And when somebody has an inquiry about what happens in agriculture or food production, we send out a scientist to tell them. I do a newsletter for a diagnostic laboratory, some of the brightest people in the country. And if I left that newsletter to be done by them, it would be the most <coughs> awful newsletter you ever, and actually before we had it, it was single line typed, black, no spaces, eight pages. Oh. <laughs> no pictures. So unfortunately, if, if you don't understand science, what's happened though today is that we continue to try to speak science while other people are taking things like emotion, wrapping it in a little bit of science, and they're making a lot more progress at, at diminishing agriculture and modern food production than we are at building it up. Marcy, any ideas on it? I think there's a place for both, but I think we relied too much on science to carry the ball for too long. And we left people to not understand. And I think we're in a society where today, it is a culture shift. People really don't know, but they do care. So we have to appeal to them in an emotional way and bring the science in at the right time. Ronnie? Uh, I'm gonna point the fingers back at the scientists a little bit here as speaking from that vantage point. We also have this, this tendency in science to speak as scientists, right? As several of you have kind of said that. We speak as scientists in scientific jargon, in scientific language, sometimes that is not real warm and fuzzy to the public. So for, for instance, I would use the example of GMO. It's common lingo to us. It's now become common lingo to the greater public that is out there. And we might question whether we would have called it that, to be real honest, if you look at the cultural cognition type of, of viewpoint today, or beta agonist. As an animal scientist, the term beta agonist, I think that's the sexiest thing in the world, <laughs> right? It's just so cool because it tells me all about the mode of action and all about that kind of, you know, what it's gonna do. It's the coolest thing in the world, but to Joe Public, 
or Jan Public, beta agonist? And that has to do with my food. How's that? That doesn't sound really positive to me, right? So there's, so there's a little bit of that in the communication uh, side as well. The other thing I was going to add is scientists are trained to not make value judgments. So we're, we're trained to do science, to produce a result and replicate that result and understand an underlying mechanism and explain nature in a way that we've not understood it before, right? But you stop there. You don't make a value judgment. The public makes the value judgment. And that's, been, that's the way I was trained. I think, Barb, that's probably the way you were trained. I would argue that we live in a world today we can't do that anymore. So, Ronnie, I get it's, arguments about you can't say this technology is safe. You can't say this crop protection product is safe because we're scientists, right? Right. There's no 100%. Right. But um, in the real world, in communicating in 140 characters or less, that's the way you all communicate now. And we need to throw out beta agonist somehow and, and morph that into something that trends. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 have, I have this distinct memory of Marcy Tessman. So Marcy and I had the opportunity to work together in my previous life advisor. And she was engaged in working with us on the animal genetics business, the development of that animal genetics business. And I have this distinct memory of sitting in the middle of the night in the Charles, Charleston Orwig war, war Room in Waukesha, Wisconsin, trying to figure out how to turn the language we were talking about into something people would understand. Remember that, Marcy? And she kept drilling on me, saying, Ronnie, you've got to create language that people will relate to emotionally. Now, imagine how to do that with DNA and SNPs, and you, you get the picture. So it's, there's, that, there's that communication gap that we have, I think, relative to the science. Uh, let me do just one more question, and then we'll, we'll get to uh, audience participation. Where are the microphones that are going to be available? Where are they? They're way up there in the back. OK. But uh, if you'll hold up a hand and uh, want to get involved in this, get ready to do that. How do I answer phone calls three or four years ago from city listeners in Chicago saying, who do I believe in agriculture? Food versus fuel. On the one hand, you've got cattlemen, you've got hog producers and dairy farmers saying ethanol is bad because it raises our price. On the other side, you've got the corn farmers saying, hey, we've sold corn for a buck 40 a bushel out of the field. It's our turn. And I've had city listeners say, so who do we believe? Who do we, Barb? Well, that's a, that's a tough one there. That's a good listener, first of all, because they've actually got the two points of view. So I, I give them an A plus on that. I think that um, you know, your answer is going to be, first of all, showing compassion, the fact that they asked the question. That's what we do. <laughs> yeah, um, don't laugh at them. You've got to listen. Uh, don't laugh at them. And I think give the uh, perspectives of both sides. Um, we, we respect both of those perspectives, I think. And so we don't throw them under the bus. We, uh, we um, present that as a complicated issue. People are smart, they understand. It upsets me, though, that we do have infighting in agriculture in yeah. many different areas. Yeah. So and I'll that bothers me, and I don't, throw that don't to Kevin know how we... That bothers me, too. Who wants to talk about it? I think we've had that for... Uh, yeah. I mean, that is, that is multiplying, it's not diminishing. I agree. We're, we're, um, if you look around the country, you have state associations, and you have... Uh, I can remember going through a tour with some college students walking through a John Deere dealership and the corn guy reached up on the bulletin board to tear down the soybean tour information that was in front of them and threw it in the trash on the way out. So you have that kind of, you have that kind of, uh, you know, infighting. And the problem with that is, again, I, I, this is one of the points I make is that agriculture has to first concern itself with the industry infrastructure, all of the people before they get to the consumer. But the first thing we want to do, because it is where everybody thinks they need to go, they want to rush and tell the consumer. I can remember grade school where we'd have fist fights over green tractors and red tractors, and that I understand. <laughs> As a matter of fact, adults are doing it today. But uh, you know, I, I go round and round with Max all the time. But uh, 
Marcy, any thoughts? I think that we have gotten caught at competing with ourselves in our communications efforts. So as you know, we are all on this quest to feed the growing world and it's going to take all forms of production. So it's time to really make sure we don't alienate each other in that conversation because we're all in it together. I spent four days last week in Louisville with 50,000 of the brightest young kids on the planet, FFA members, and I was encouraged by the new national officer team. Two of the new national officers, when I said, what do you want to accomplish? Two of them were very passionate about wanting to explain agriculture in an understandable way to the public. But we so often get accused of talking to ourselves. How many people here today are not in agriculture or agribusiness? Mm. One, two, mm, it's one of them. <laughs> okay. And that's one of the things that we are, con how do we do this, Ronnie? It's a real challenge, you know, when I, I mentioned earlier about the 2%, yeah. right? So we have people saying things like, okay, we're 2% of the population in the U.S. It's, it's more than that in other regions of the world, but in the U.S. and in North America, it'd be roughly that amount. So what, are we each responsible for talking to 49 others? You know, if we split the difference or, you know, it, how, do we, how do we reach uh, that greater population? I, I do want to go back to the infighting issue. Okay. And, and I want to try to say this the right way. Marcy brought up that there are differing viewpoints on production, there are differing viewpoints on markets, uh, on segmentation of food markets. Unfortunately, I think we have fallen prey to criticizing the ends of the spectrum. So being critical of conventional agriculture, or often called industrial agriculture. I hate that term, but it's I do used too. over and over again. Uh, labeling that as non-family farmers and so forth and so on. Or being critical in the reverse of organic or natural or not, you know, non-conventional or local. It's a big tent. There is a big tent there and we need every part of it. But we, and we, quit, we need to quit cannibalizing one another in the way that we think about production system or inputs or the, the, the way that our food is produced because of differing views socially or, or culturally. Um, do I believe that we will feed the world with organic production and, and natural production? I personally don't. I don't either. Believe that we'll be able to do that because I don't think we can produce enough efficiently enough for the world. But do I think we should have an opportunity for organic production? Absolutely. If it can be economically successful, we should be supportive of that rather than fighting one another about it, my opinion. As you said, it's a big tent and there's room for everybody under that tent because whatever the consumer wants, there's a farmer somewhere to fill it. And, uh, and we need to do that. But well, we've got to quit condemning one another. Absolutely. I'm with you on that. Any questions out there? Any? Okay. Right here. Well, can we get a mic down here quickly? I want, wait I've out. got one up here. Um, Alex Peterson, uh, Southwest Nebraska in the cheap seats. Uh, my question is, there's a national radio show that uh, adamantly attacks GMOs from corn to being fed to beef, to literally killing the people that eat this. Then they get people that, uh, to validate their, bo their views, that are raising organic, uh, pork, beef, corn, and these people don't realize they're cutting their legs out from underneath the entire industry. How do you go against a person that is so adamantly against GMOs, and the entire process when it's just technology and we're trying to feed the world what are the arguments to something someone that is so blind they won't listen well I know what I do but let's see what the panel does that's a tough question and an excellent question I think that um, in general in the work that I do um, 
some of these folks, they do have that sort of abolitionist view and they're so far to their side that they, you, you can't have a conversation constructively with them and try to affect change or they, they're not open, they're not transparent and you're trying to be so it's futile. So we talk about the moderate middle and those are the folks that um, we, we strive to communicate with in the policy and regulatory arena that, that I work in. And, and that's quite effective because among adults we can have a good conversation and share uh, differing views, lay out the facts as we know each know them or think we know them and try to move the ball. I actually had a conversation with a soccer mom, which probably was a big mistake, um, but I, I talked to her about genetically modified. She was adamant that she was not going to allow her child to consume anything genetic, genetically modified. And uh, the first thing I did was ask her what it was. What is your understanding of genetically modified? What is it and why are you afraid of it? And uh, I didn't get a very good answer. And so the very first thing, I'm from Missouri, the very first thing I tried to do was show her. So we actually took her out <coughs> on a farm and showed her the process. And then we put her in touch with people that I think are, are highly educated in that, in that area. And you know, at the end of the time, I'm not sure we moved her, but I know this, she, she was much less polarized than she was when we began the conversation. You're not always gonna do that, and, and Ronnie mentioned this in our conversation earlier because many people come to these discussions today with a, a particular world view. And, and that's why I have difficulty saying, you know, you're going to be able to enter into conversations with some of them and move them because they do have that world view and it doesn't matter what you do. And you can prove science all day long. It doesn't matter um, because at the end of the day, they're still going to attack it because of that world view. Any other thoughts you want to offer on that? I, I would offer this as an observation. Um, so I've, I had the opportunity to visit with Rob Fraley, who's the yeah. chief science officer, chief tech technology officer of Monsanto, a couple of weeks ago. He was involved in our, our um, global water conference at the Water for Food Institute in Seattle. And Rob, as some of you will know, was one of the World Food Prize laureates a year ago. Uh, three biotech pioneers that were honored uh, jointly with the World Food Prize last year. And there was quite an outcry about that, uh, about the World Food Prize, the Nobel Prize of Agriculture, so to speak, in honor of uh, Norman Borlaug, being given to biotech pioneers who were responsible for the development of this technology and some of the commercialization, in Rob's case, of the technology. And Rob, Rob has gone to starting to talk about, you know, he talks the science, and he talks about the application of the science, but he talks about it in the terms of humanity, right? And he's, he's begun to have a very concerted effort about that on social, right. on, uh, social media. An observation he, he made to me, and I agree with him on this, I, I thought the same thing before he said it, and he verbalized it very well. And it's going to sound self-serving, and he was not saying it in a self-serving way. Much of the opposition to some of these technologies is the institutions from which they come. I'm going to say that again. Much of the opposition to some of these technologies is not the technology, or in many cases the application of the technologies. It's who's providing the technology. So agricultural technology has been largely relayed to the industry by corporate agribusiness. And Monsanto, Rob's company, is an example of that. Often you know, you'll see it referred to as the big evil Monsanto, as if this corporation is an evil empire because they're purveying this technology to the world. And I, I think Rob's right that part of the opposition to the technology is the institution delivering the technology to the user of the technology. You might think of it as the anti-Walmart kind of syndrome. Big corporate, anti too big and corporate. Uh, so I just offer that as an observation as well tied to GMOs. Any okay. other questions? Okay, uh, got a mic, okay. I do. David Dorfer, Texas Tech University. Uh, 
question maybe related to the battle of the infighting between commodities, should we use corn for feed or fuel, might be related to this in that consumers are wanting to know what is the carbon footprint in this t-shirt I just bought? What is, where is this beef being raised and how is it being raised? The transparency, the traceability issues, but perhaps the other end is resistance from producers not wanting to give the information. This is my business, it's my private operating management guide. I don't want to necessarily share that. Are we looking at maybe a bigger conflict coming? Okay, before we get too far away, I want to go back to the guy up here. What do I do when I see things or hear? Some people, you'll never change their mind because they are so biased they're stupid. But uh, <laughs> you don't tell them that. <laughs> but if I see a story on CBS News that I disagree with, I'll write the producer and I'll say, there's another side of the story and I'd like to help you tell it. And you may not get any response, but if we're not proactive on things like that, the other people are. PETA's proactive, HSUS is proactive. We've got to be just as proactive as we can be. Any comments now on this dialogue? Mars? Go ahead. <laughs> well, going I was still, on I was the still back thing. on the other one. Uh, I was yeah. still wanting to make a comment on the other one, but that's okay. Say the question again, David. We, we got sidetracked listening to Orion. I'll shorten it then. Transparency. Uh, oh, yeah. Consumers wanting more information about their products, yeah. carbon footprint, traceability. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Producers not wanting to share the information or questioning who pays for me recording all this information. So are we looking at a bigger battle coming? I'll, I'll harken back with an example in history. And there will be a number of you in the room that will remember this vividly because it had big impact on Nebraska when it happened. So in 2003, when the cow that stole Christmas, as it's so affectionately referred to in the industry, the, the BSE case uh, in Washington State that then impacted the industry and closed borders and closed export trade for a period of time, Obvious huge impact in Nebraska because of the size and scope of the beef industry here. I remember sitting thinking what an opportunity for the industry, presented in a very unfortunate way, but what an opportunity for the industry because here's the chance for the beef industry in this case to open itself up to the public, back to the producer. And there have been a number of us who have been talking about that for a number of years. How do you create coordinated supply chains? How do you trace back to the origin of the product? We'd seen it go that way in Europe. We'd seen it go that way in Japan, where the face of the producer was the brand of the product. And it was tied to that individual producer and the wholesomeness of that producer, which, as Kevin said, when you show people that they change their perspective when they see it and really understand it. We missed that opportunity in the beef industry, I think, because we chose to not go that direction. We chose to go away from trace back, away from that back to the producer that was there for the, I think, David, the reasons you're saying, concern about liability, concern about tracing back to me in a litigious kind of society and culture that we live in, and regulatory, well, perhaps burden and overload. But that's an example of maybe we do need to be, put our face on our product, and it would overcome some of these issues that, that I think we have. And Questions? The, oh, Marcy? Yeah. Go I ahead. Guess I, wanted, I do want to make a point about that. We're at a juncture where transparency is not a negotiation. So it's time to jump on. It's time to embrace it. And uh, I think it was one of the um, people that were featured in Farmland, I remember him saying, just tell me what you want to know. I'm glad to tell you. And I think that's, it's our job to help each other tell the story and be transparent. And I would also say farmers are farmers. 
they, they don't, many of them do not want to be in the communications business. That's yeah, probably why yeah. we can exist and have our role in the <laughs> agriculture industry. Because most farmers, I, I don't know any farmer that does not want to communicate about what they do. But you have to realize, I mean, when you get to be a full-time farmer in whatever capacity that may be, beef, dairy, pork, corn, soybean, whatever, that's a full-time job. And then somebody says, now we also want you to do these things. And, and, and so, you know, communication is something that I think now we have all these different programs trying to help farmers become the spokespeople that, you know, and, and all that's good and well. But, but at the end of the time, again, I don't see farmers being hesitant about providing information. I see them being very open and willing to do that. We were talking at lunch, why is it so tough? Food, Inc. is in classrooms all over the country. Yeah. Why is it so tough to get farmland? in those classrooms? Well, um, I would say it sometimes smacks of a bias um, immediately, whereas a food ink seems to be somehow, you know, in the middle. Okay. Uh, I don't know how that works, but um, I have been to many, many college campuses that have required reading of Fast Food Nation and Food Inc. And uh, the other thing is, though, go to the bookstores. If I was to go to a bookstore, they literally proliferate when you turn around because they have so many different books against agriculture. Yeah. What book written in a, in a Michael Pollan-esque style is for agriculture? What, what to out, find. outside of farmland, which just came out, right. what documentary was there? Th there was no tool. We didn't invest in pop culture. Barb, did you have a comment? Yeah, I just wanted to jump back to the transparency issue. I agree with Marcy that it's really um, not negotiable right now, but it is still voluntary. And you know, in the, in what I do, we respect the private uh, the privacy rights of our our growers and our farmers and ranchers, and so they can choose. But farmers are very smart, and when there's a market opportunity and transparency, and putting your face on your product offers you a your family a better living, I think, you know, we're jumping on that yeah. and we yeah. can't hold back. I'd also like to share that my senior in high school um, just asked me the other day if I'd ever heard of Michael Pollan. So he's getting a heavy dose at his high school of the books that um, you're referring to. And somehow I think it's academically considered uh, uh, robust to bring those kinds of uh, treatises forward and not That's the ones word. that balance that discussion. So, so there's a true lack of balance in the elementary schools I and agree. the high schools. Okay, questions? There's one right here, there's one right here, right, right down in the, the expensive <laughs> seats. I think she's all the way okay. up yeah. the top. She's or way up at the top. Way at the top. Well, all the way at the top. Way up in the balcony, doctor, okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tala, I'm Tala Awada and the School of Natural Resources at TNL. And this is very interesting um, discussion to me. And to me, the, the, the question is more fundamental and goes beyond the agriculture. Um, there is no question that technology is going to continue to play a very important role in communication. And with it comes miscommunication. And to me, um, there are two tiers here we're talking about. We have the communicator perspective that they have to deliver the information fast. They are in competition with other media. And they are given fact, but also they are inserting their passion, their biases, and their opinion. And on the other hand, you have the audience that are unable to separate opinion and biases from fact and sciences. So how can we, how can we train a new population or train us to be able to, to, to separate the fact from fiction, I want to say, and, and form an informed decision when it comes, whether it's agriculture, whether it's the war, whether it's anything. So I want to I wanna hear a perspective on both the communication uh, part and the audience part. Ronnie, we'll start with you. How do we, how do we educate? The okay, okay. <laughs> Marcy, go ahead. You got this one, Marcy. I'm not sure I can answer all of that. But I'm going to use an example of social media. I think that uh, some people joke still about social media and how much it has taken over our society today. But Ronnie, your example of uh, Monsanto was really key because what we've seen in social media, and this is working in agriculture as we communicate to non-agriculture audiences, is we're 
going to a very personal communication. It's, it's really a conversation, and it's person to person. And just as Monsanto has learned, their use of social media has become very personal. And that is very, um, it's authentic. It offers a lo level of transparency that we might not have been able to predict. And I think it's been very important for us to learn how better to relate to people. Any other comments? I might make a comment about the use of Twitter. Um, in my experience, we've, we've actually created a dialogue. It is a conversation. It can be about the hard science facts, but you can uh, soften those so that they're asking questions. They're putting out uh, some doubt so that the receiver is saying, oh, that might be. I have a question about that now. And so uh, you can actually shift the conversations toward sort of uh, your uh, the, a more fact-based uh, mm -hmm. attentiveness to the issue. So I think Twitter can be useful very much in sharing our facts. We have a couple of questions down here. Do we have a microphone? And here we come. Yeah. Jesse, thank you. Well, um, is it on? Yeah, it's on. Um, one thing that would be nice if we could get agriculture taught in the schools, let's say it was a required class for junior high kids, maybe take a semester of agriculture to find out what is agriculture in Nebraska, and what are the issues, what, um, what are M uh, GMOs, what, are, what, are, what, are, what is the animal rights, how animals are raised on the farm, and then take field trips to go visit local farms and have local farmers come in and talk to the class, and um, be it school board members or their parents talking about what really is agriculture. Um, I've been an ag teacher, FFA advisor, for 35 years, and um, currently I'm superintendent of schools. I've been superintendent of three schools, and when I go in as a superintendent and ask the principal and guidance counselor, would it be okay if I teach an intro to ag class to eighth graders? <coughs> and they say, well, you're the boss. <laughs> but it's too bad that we can't get, um, that, that an intro to ag class at the high school level or, or junior high level uh, so that the kids would understand the, the true uh, facts. And you have to be really careful because if you're biased and you tell them what to believe, then they're going to have parents that don't share those views and they're going to be upset with you too. So you have to show both, both sides of it and let the kids make up their mind uh, what, what's true. But, uh, they're a captive audience, you can, um, especially when they're younger, and they question the parents, do you know, have you ever heard of this stuff? And you see it on Facebook, you see it in the news, and, and, um, and create that. Because sometimes kids go home and they say, what'd you learn today? Nothing. But if, you, if you're teaching them stuff that's pertinent, current uh, news, the, it's, it's good dialogue between the kids and their parents. Well, at the FFA convention last week, one of the big topics of conversation, we're not graduating enough VOAG teachers like you. There is a shortage of vocational agricultures across the country, so that could be part of it. But I fully agree, PETA is in the grade schools, and uh, we ought to be there. Anything we can do, Ronnie? Well, I, 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 the comment is a good one, uh, and some people will remember, I can't remember whether this was last year or the year before, Director Eyeball may remember, but in our, in our unicameral here in Nebraska, Senator Sullivan actually introduced um, a study resolution to look at this issue of teaching agricultural sciences and in integrating agricultural sciences into the curriculum uh, throughout Nebraska schools. I'm, I'm not sure where that got to, but that, was, that issue was raised in the Education Committee of the unicameral. Doesn't it make sense that if you're trying to teach young people about science, that there are an overwhelming number of opportunities to teach scientific principles directly from agricultural science. You know, the, it's, it's a classic way to teach science. Our biochemistry department here at the university does that every day. They teach biochemistry through the lens 
of agricultural science. And to go into an active learning classroom and see a group of pre-med students, largely, learning that through the lens of agricultural science is a cool thing to behold. And you walk out of there with a very different view of this whole area of agricultural science. So I would, I would love to see integration of agriculture into the science curriculum from 7 through 12, for example, and what better place to do it than Nebraska? So I'll Kevin, would it help? Yes. Uh, I, let me, um, we just published this at, at truthinfood.com. We just published the top 10 findings from a college outreach program. And those findings are basically reproducing what we're talking here. Um, kids, when they show up on the college campus, are predisposed to believe a negative narrative about agriculture, and especially agribusiness. And when you get into the discussion of sustainability, it doesn't matter what your science shows because you're guilty. You're part of agribusiness immediately. Those are the findings. And, and, and what you're seeing is even professors, go look up Michael Pollan on Wikipedia. He is listed as an activist before he's listed as a professor. But there's few professors that teach agriculture with the same passion and purpose that Michael Pollan teaches against it. And that's the problem is that kids go into these things and we always talk about it from agriculture and that's great. But look, agriculture is a part of food. I walked along a college campus with a young man and he said, he kept talking about how bad modern agriculture was. And then he stopped and he said, by the way, I got the unlimited meal plan. Do you want to go get something to eat? Now, he didn't even connect those two things. And if you talk agriculture to them and not the larger food system or food production system, you could miss a lot of people. But it's an incredible, it's a great time to be in communications. Um, but the very fact we're having this conversation about it just shows how many times they have lapped us on this track. Yeah, I'd just like to jump in here. I, I love your vision. I would love to see that happen. In uh, what I do, there are, um, there's a political lobbying effort for STEM um, curriculum, science, technology, engineering, and math. And uh, there are also those that support a STEAM curriculum, which would add the A for agriculture. So I think that uh, you're right on target. It's uh, a large lift. Uh, there are probably uh, organizations working on this, but it, it gets to the very heart of curricula and uh, all the politics and that surround that and the policy. Yeah, Barb, it's exciting that the STEM Connector group yes. that's yeah. involved yes. in STEM education just this past year put out its yeah. first report on food and ag. Yes, they did. And a new food and ag council yeah. that we're part of. That's, and they're partnering that's with 4-H that. and FFA. So this is STEM educator. You could look that up. Jesse, one of the things we didn't talk about is when I should say goodbye. Uh, 4.40 right now, how much more time do we have? About 10 minutes more. Okay, you know, one thing we haven't talked about, and I would like just a comment from each of you. We're talking about what does agricultural communication mean in the 21st century? Can we talk about the producer for a while? I think there's an overload of real knowledge and no knowledge on the internet. How can a producer, a farmer, rancher, whatever, how can he focus on what he should be paying attention to? Any ideas? Because boy, there's a ton of stuff out there by commercial companies and by self-appointed advisors and by bloggers. I have a rule on the internet if I see something that interests me, I will check three other sources before I'll put it on the air because I don't know what to trust. See, the, I use the internet a lot, but I'm very bothered by the fact it's destroying spelling, it's destroying the use of good grammar, and it's destroying the art of conversation. And I make my living conversing. So, But any ideas on what farmers and ranchers should do? Well, I'll kick off. Um, Farmers and ranchers are, are great communicators and we all know that they're highly trusted and valued in, in conversations about what they do. 
So those that are interested um, need to reach out to their local agribusiness organization, their farm bureau, their commodity organization, and they're, they'll be embraced and they become voices in the food dialogue. So that, that being said, I think that um, I'd like to again advocate for the youth movement here. I think that the more we can do to uh, make sure that our students are, are ready to kick that conversation off, very difficult conversations, but to share the scientific facts of agriculture in a very humane and compassionate way, I think that's uh, a, a tool we have to have in our toolbox going forward. So I'm really enamored by, you know, Farmers Fight, Hunger You, the, these organizations that are trying to create our new uh, influencers. I would uh, commend them to a bigger audience, though. I think they need to talk beyond just the ag, ag community, and they're going to be the ones that make this 21st century be all it can be. So. Kevin, what mama blogger do you follow? No, I don't. <laughs> okay. I do, uh, I do see, um, I am in, probably the closest one I've probably been involved to in that would be um, homeschooling moms. Um, we actually homeschooled for a while, so, so I uh, inadvertently got involved in this network, and uh, it was just astonishing to me the, the information being shared in that network about the evils of modern agriculture. And when I started to actually propose ideas, it was as though they had never heard them before. So um, it, there's, there's so much to that. You know, a farmer can go out, and you do something very different. You're looking at multiple sources. Even agriculture itself doesn't check sources anymore. I know agricultural media outlets that have published activist press releases verbatim without even editing or checking the source. No way. And that's it. That's called internet scraping. So that's one of the things we're talking about here today is how does agriculture communicate itself in the 21st century? While you can use the tools of the internet, and while you can look at the tools, the very first thing, again, I think we have to do is get our infrastructure in order. If grocery retailers don't know what's happening in agriculture and 52% of food flows through a grocery retailer, we're in trouble. If, 40 some, if the remaining 48% goes through restaurateurs and they don't know what's going on in agriculture, then again, we don't have our own house in order in that. <clears throat> to go to the consumer is, is, is just um, giving money away. Marcy? We're in the business of helping producers and farmers communicate, and we just really feel like it's important to not try to stick to your knitting and your business at hand, but step out. Get involved in the local community. Be part of the communication within that community. It doesn't mean that you have to get on TV or you have to get involved in a national organization where you're on stage. It's in the grassroots. It's getting involved in the local communities. And that's what we need to do, is encourage each other to be a part of that. Ronnie, I'm soon going to yeah, give I'm it to you take for just the wrap a little, up, little different tack to your question and go back to the producer and sifting of information for the producer herself or himself, right? And how do they do that? How do they know what's accurate and what's real and what, what works? We've relied traditionally on extension to do that for us. If you go back over decades of time in our history, we relied heavily on outreach and extension services to do that. That model has changed substantially from state to state in the U.S. and across the U.S. Yes. generally. And it's morphing very rapidly as we speak in the way that that outreach is happening. I would wager it needs to be more important in the future rather than less important as the businesses continue to get more sophisticated, as technology continues to get more sophisticated, uh, our producers continue to get more sophisticated, they, they're still going to rely and need to rely on a sifter of that technology. The model with which we do that probably will look quite different than what it has traditionally. And there's pain associated with that. We're experiencing some of that in our own system today with the way our communication structures is set up within Extension and, and the Greater Ag Program at the university. But we've got to rely on that source to be able to connect and sift that information, I think, more in the future rather than less. Can I jump in for a second? Okay, one more second, and then I gotta meet the clock. Let me link uh, 
off of what Ronnie said to the uh, symposium today on the future of big data. And I raised this at our lunch earlier today, but this uh, indeed is, um, they're saying the revolution of the future. We're streaming real-time information and right. we can actually predict what people are thinking. And the earlier we can do that, the better we can communicate perhaps in a, mm -hmm. on social issues, on, on their understanding of agriculture. So I thought that was quite uh, a powerful symposium today. I wanted to bring that up as a part of technology and our discussion here today on communicating in the future, and I think it'll have some relevance big time. So. Okay, one last chance for any final comment before I go to Ronnie. Okay. Let me say, before I sit down and turn it over to Ronnie, it has been an honor to be a part of the Hearman Lecture Series. Uh, indeed, an honor. And I'll tell you why I have the best job in the world. I, I was talking to some students up here earlier, and I, I titled my book, You Can't Dream Big Enough, because I could never dream what I'd be doing, and they can't dream what they're going to be doing. But uh, the thing I look at as we move forward is the opportunity to play an important role. And uh, I have the best job in the world. I haven't worked a day <coughs> in 61 years since I became a broadcaster. Last week, four days, 55,000 FFA members. Today, University of Nebraska at Lincoln doing an outstanding job in educating and communicating. Tomorrow, I'll be in Kansas City for the Agriculture Future of America with about 800 college kids preparing for agribusiness careers. Man, it doesn't get any better than that. And it doesn't get any better than being with you. So thank you very much. And Ronnie, it's yours. Uh, those of you that have been to our Hearman lectures in the past know that we have a tradition that we started the first year of the lectures to give the people that come to us to give this honor lecture a memory of, of coming to Nebraska and of being with us at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Uh, it's a medal that is uh, built around the tree of life and the tree of life associated with agriculture that we present to each of our Hearman lecturers. So each of our four today who have joined us at the University of Nebraska, Orion, your leadership, and Marcy, and Kevin, and Barb, will we'll have you take these as a memento. And please join me again in thanking them for a great discussion on this important topic about ag communication. <laughs> I'll just close by bringing to your attention the next Hearman lecture that is scheduled for January the 13th. Uh, it will be in this room as well, uh, 7 p.m. It's an evening lecture that night. Uh, that lecture will be delivered by Dr. Allison Van Eneman. Allison is a professor at the University of California, Davis. Uh, she's an animal scientist, was this past October, just last month, uh, the recipient of the Council on Ag Science and Technologies Communicator Award. Uh, for the year. Uh, Allison has become a very uh, strong voice, kind of the leading voice, I would say, nationally in the U.S. and abroad around animal biotechnology. So she'll come and talk to us about communicating in the animal biotechnology sector and what some of the issues are associated uh, with that, that uh, topic. So please mark that on your calendar, January the 13th. Uh, 7 p.m. for our next Tierman Lecture. Thanks for being here today. Thanks again to our lecturers, and have a good evening.